Welcome cogs. As a way to make the design more accessible by cutting down on the part count, and as a kind of engineering challenge to myself, I took one of my original eye mechanism designs and took out all 45 screws and replaced every single one with snap fit pins, joints and latches. I also designed a new circuit board with JLC PCB which conveniently snaps into place and powers the Arduino and servos simultaneously with a single voltage input, removing the need for the old servo driver board and finally ridding the design of breadboards and jumper cables. In this video, I'm going to take you through the design process, including some extras like this nunchuck style controller and my realistic 3D printed eyes, and I'll give you all the files and components you need to make this yourself for free. So what is the point in changing the design in this way? In engineering and product design, design for assembly, or DFA, is a methodology used to improve a design by considering how it actually gets put together. It's a subject you can get really deep into, but at a high level, we're aiming to reduce the number of parts and make the design simpler and easier to assemble. Snap fits are an easy shortcut to improve a design in ways which would make it perform better in a DFA analysis, but without having to necessarily use your brain too much. Simply by replacing what was once a screw with two parts snapping together, we eliminate at least one component, the screw, and drastically cut down the assembly time with an instantaneous, satisfying snap, which would have been a time-consuming series of half turns with an Allen key. Of course, the DFA methodology has a ton more detail we could get into, but for this design I just wanted to eliminate every single fastener, mainly as a sort of challenge to push the limits of the mechanism. The mechanical structure of the eye mechanism is basically the same in both designs. We have a centrally mounted servo between the eyes which controls the lateral motion of both eyeballs through a lever. The eyes themselves connect on one part to a stationary pivot point, and on another point the aforementioned laterally moving lever. This entire assembly is on a hinge, which is rocked vertically up and down by another servo, mounted a little further back, controlling eyes both up and down motions simultaneously. Now, what makes a good snap fit design? If we were getting into injection molding, there's loads of neat tricks, optimizations, and variations, but for 3D printed designs, we're much more constrained, and so the design becomes a little bit more limited and therefore straightforward. There are a lot of good design guidelines out there, but I think I've found a few extras through trial and error. A pretty well known one is that you should design your parts to flex in the direction it's strong in, and in fact this rule drives the design of basically all of the joints. The layer adhesion of a 3D printed part is always going to be weaker in flexion than the actual strength of the plastic if it was solid, so always take note of which plane your design needs to be strongest in. Having a latch which is printed vertically and has layer lines running in the same direction which force is applied makes it very likely to break as it goes in. Printing the same latch in a different orientation facilitates easy bending and high strength. For this reason, I made separate clamping components to hold all of the servos in place. I could have further reduced part count by building the snapping latches into the base itself, but this would have violated our rule and made the part weak. These servos are held in rock solid. Another point I want to make is that if you were designing these parts to be injection molded or something else a little more repeatable and mass manufacturable, we could actually use maths to design all of our latches properly properly, but since there's so much variation in mechanical properties depending on printer settings and materials, I don't actually think it's worth it at this stage of the design. Later I'll show you all of the different materials I tested this design with. My unique requirement was that in the previous design a lot of the fasteners were actually being used as pivot points. This meant that in order to follow the rule and keep the flexion in the strong plane, I need to print my snap fit pivots as narrow vertical towers which do suffer when it comes to laterally applied forces because again, the layer can delaminate and the part can fail. But printing this way is also pretty important for a hinge because by making your circles parallel to the print bed, you also get much more round holes and rods which make for much better pivot points. The design I ended up settling on was a kind of hollow pin with a cutout, a kind of C shape which deforms just enough to snap in place but maintains a nice circular pivot too. In some places this is smaller than others and it's probably just approaching the limit of what I could make work with a 3D printed part but it seems to actually work great. Previously you may have seen I made my eyes with a complicated setup including a drill, airbrush, silicone resin and pin and they do look super realistic but this time I wanted to try making things a little cheaper and low mess. I do believe that making my original eyes so realistic is the main factor that led to their success and I think that the intersection of engineering with art is kind of my whole USP as a YouTube channel and as a person. 
One way that I was recently able to upgrade my knowledge and skills on that intersection between art and science was with a course in creative coding using the Brilliant app. Brilliant is an app and website where you learn by doing in a hands-on way with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. So I'm someone who needs to be hands-on in order to really take in a concept. Brilliant works really well for me because they build on a concept from the ground up and let you get hands-on and experiment in from the very start. Their courses help you to build your critical thinking skills through problem solving rather than just memorization, which also makes you a better thinker overall in addition to the knowledge you're gaining. Their content is crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals. You can learn with just a few minutes each day, building a productive habit, the opposite of mindless scrolling. The creative coding course was a good way for me to get a refresher on Python style programming, which I like to revise every now and then. And Brilliant's programming courses are a great way to build a foundation, which you can use in the real world. It can help you to get familiar even if you had zero coding experience by using their drag and drop editor. You'll learn all the essentials from loops and variables to nesting and conditionals. And most importantly, in my view, you'll learn to think like a programmer and build a strong foundation for writing solid programs. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash Will Cogley or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. When I did these eyes previously, I made an entire video dedicated to how I painstakingly made moulds and castings, but I wanted to make a version that had no mixing, no pouring, no airbrushes and no casting. I printed the eye blanks in ASA and with its translucency and low layer height, it's pretty much impossible to see the layer lines. The iris is concave because it gives the illusion of depth and that's why the iris is a solid hole too. I printed the irises with watercolour pencils and pastels, layering up gradually between coats of Mr. Superclear, guess who's been watching Delightful, and finally used some UV resin to help get the effect of the cornea and add some depth and realism. It's not as good as my original solid casted eyes, but I was pretty happy to have a result which looks great from a distance with only a fraction of the effort and expense. As I mentioned, I wanted to improve my electronic situation. Up until now, all of my eye mechanisms have used the PCA9685 servo driver board, mostly because I was scared of electronics beyond Arduinos and shields. Now you can make a PCB, which you can solder yourself, and it's actually super cheap and fast, but because I love the decadence of a pre-assembled board, I started off by browsing JLC PCB's library of parts to find a voltage regulator I could use to convert a 12 volt input into a 5 volt line, which the SG90 servos can use. Through the parts library, I was then able to find the datasheet for these LM2596Ss and quickly design a circuit to house an Arduino micro and have breakouts for the servos and inputs. Everything is powered from a single input, whereas previously I kept the Arduino plugged into a USB or I sketchily powered it from the VCC of the server board in the Arduino's 5V pin, which I actually have no idea why that worked honestly. I uploaded the Gerber files directly to the website and less than a week later I got my shiny new boards. I did make a mistake in that I made the output pins for all the servos too small. Thankfully I was able to bodge it and solder the pins on top of the board, but it is a quick fix to wind these out for the next version. As is always the case with JLC PCB, the boards came out pristine. I always doubt myself when it comes to electronics design, but the typical use circuit that came with the LM256's datasheet worked perfectly, and I had a very clean board to drive all of my servos with. The code itself is pretty simple. The only quirk that you might not notice until I point it out is that the eyelids will actually follow the direction of the eyes slightly. This is a very minor tweak that actually makes a big improvement to the realism. Back in 2019, I made an entire 10 minute video about an iMech controller I designed, which was inspired by a Wii nunchuck. Controllers and small electronics housings are one of my favourite things to design, but since they actually perform very poorly on here, you'll have to make do with 30 seconds this time. In keeping with the snap fit theme, I had to eliminate all screws from my controller. I massively overestimated how thick the latches needed to be to securely hold the joystick in, so I had to press very hard to get it in. But I got there, and then once it was in, I quickly sorted it by hand, and it does work, even if it pins me to have to hold on to something so shoddy. Joking aside, I do want to make a proper go of this controller so in a future video I want to try and make a wireless rechargeable design. Onto the assembly. I sometimes feel like my explanations are wasted since the best way to assemble in my view is to refer to the 3D assembly model which I've attached in the download pack and use this video as a reference if you need to. This time I'm hoping the snap fits will give a satisfying ASMR quality so I'm going to do it in silence. Good luck with the build.
So which filaments worked best for this design? Initially, I was quite skeptical this would work at all in PLA, so I decided to test out the design with a few of the different filaments I had to hand. These were Bamboo Labs Basic PLA, Esun's Upgraded Matte PLA, Prusa's Galaxy Black PLA, and some Bamboo ABS 2. The Bamboo PLA worked out really well, none of the snap fits were too brittle or too stiff, and all the parts seemed well balanced strength-wise. The Galaxy Black looked great with the metallic fillers hard in the layer lines, but I did find it to be a little too hard and brittle for all of the snap fits to work reliably. Although it was fine once it was together, two of the latches broke on the way in and had to be reprinted. It was also a bit squeaky. The Esun upgraded matte PLA is a favourite of mine because it has such a lovely finish and it just kind of feels good. Nothing broke, but I did feel like some of the parts were flexing a lot and I was worried they might snap, but after assembly this one worked out really nice too. Finally, the ABS predictably worked great. It's really low friction, which I love, and it's more flexible, which meant that the snap fits were a lot easier to snap on. However, I did find that the servo horns were a little loose and slipping, I guess just because the part was a little too flexible. But, you may be asking yourself, did I actually make the design any better? Thankfully, DFA is designed to be quantifiable. For now, let's just take the estimated assembly times as per the charts. Now, of course, we could actually build both designs and test it that way. From experience, I can tell you the old design takes about 30 minutes and the snap fit one takes about five minutes, but we can use these charts to estimate assembly time before we even prototype anything. If we only take the 45 screws I mentioned the original had, and bearing in mind there are other processes we're ignoring for now, we get an estimated time of at least 8 seconds per fastener, times 45 is 6 minutes. For the snap fits in the new design, of which there are around 32, we get a minimum of 2 seconds per fastener, which adds up to just 1 minute, a 6 fold improvement. It would be silly of me not to acknowledge that this is just a guideline, and usually common sense and logic can help you to figure out which is a better design decision. I still have this and other DFA principles in mind when I design anything. Snap fits can be annoying. Sometimes they're fragile, sometimes the resistance varies a lot, and sometimes they can't easily be removed. But they are cool, and coolness is the most important factor in engineering. If you'd like to support the channel and receive a complimentary Nilheim Megatronics sticker pack, join my Patreon page where I post early project updates and sneak peeks. A huge thank you to everyone who supports me, especially my patrons, and I'll see you guys in the next video.